Hey, East Point family, we're so glad that you're joining us this morning. Our last service of 2023, our online service only. Hey, my name is Ryder. This is Rachel. Um, whether you're watching at home in front of the TV with the whole family or just laying in bed watching from your phone, Tony has a special message as we wrap up 2023 together. And hey, I just wanna remind you on this last day of 2023 about something we've been talking about the whole month of December, and that's the gift. This year, our focus for the gift is really here, near, and far. And we get to partner with organizations that are making a difference in our community here, near, and far. One of those organizations is Living Water. Next year, we are taking a team to the Dominican Republic to participate in some clean water projects and serve the people in the Dominican Republic. Our near focus is an organization called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. And Sleep in Heavenly Peace mission is that no kid sleeps on the floor. Unfortunately, that's a reality in our community. There are kids without beds. And so they work to provide beds for kids in all places. And we want to partner with them and help them out this year. And then finally, our last focus is here, here at East Point. We want to end the year strong and really continue creating a safe place for people to find and follow Jesus. So thank you for participating in the gift this year. Yeah, and really what we're looking for is 100% participation this year. That's our goal. So whether you give a dollar, five dollars, an amount larger than that, that's just really our goal. It's not about how much you give, but participating in this together. And we are really excited about it. Yeah, and one more thing that we're really excited about is our Dream Teamer of the Year. We set up a coffee for our Dream Teamer of the Year to let them know that they had won this special award. They had no idea, but our staff was waiting upstairs for them, and I want you to watch this. Molly, come on in. We got a special seat. Come grab a seat on the couch. Dream Teamer of the Year. What are you gonna do next? I don't know. <laughs> Cry? This okay. is so nice. Thank you all hats. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I love that. We love the dream team around here. We truly could not make all of this happen without our dream team. And we're excited for the ways that our dream team is going to grow and make a difference here at East Point in 2024. Hey, now we're gonna transition. Tony's got a great message for us to end off 2023 strong. Let's take a look. What is God's will for your life in 2024? I think that's a great question for any one of us to ask because the reality is, is that 2023 is come and 2023 is just about over. And I want you to think about over the last 12 months with me, think about the last year. I mean, it goes so fast. How was it for you? Did you enjoy your year? Did you accomplish some things that you set out to accomplish, right? Did you, did you meet some goals? Did you get out of debt? Did you lose the pounds? Did you go on the trip, right? How was this last year for you? Because the reality is that all of us, we got a year older. Your kids got taller, right? We just kept moving forward. Maybe this last year was good. Maybe you faced some things that were really difficult, though. Maybe this last year you lost a friend or a family member or you got some bad news, something unexpected didn't go your way. Maybe you're still just having to show up to the same job that you dread going back to each day, or maybe you're just sick and tired of being single and you've just been trying to find a special person for your life. I don't know what this last year has looked like for you or what your current reality is, but all of us, we face throughout the course of any year, we go through some ups and some downs, don't we? 
And as we head into this new year, I think it's fitting. In fact, we often ask ourselves a question. It's a common question. If you believe in any kind of God, it's a question that you often will ask. And as we head into this new year, I think it's worth asking. It is God, what is your will? What's your, if there is a God, then do you have a will? Do you have a plan? Do you have a purpose for my life and for my every day? And, and we often ask this question, especially when things aren't going our way, right? When we felt like we've gotten, we've gotten dealt a bad hand of cards called life. And, and so we're asking, God, what's the purpose in all of that? Where are you in all of this? What is your will in all of this? And maybe you've even taken this question to some friends, uh, some other people that would consider themselves followers of Jesus, and they've given you advice. Maybe you've even given advice like this. Because there's a handful of verses in the Bible that talk about God's will. And, and I think we use a few verses to try to help encourage each other. But these verses also kind of, kind of create some questions for us. There's a verse, for instance, in uh, the book of Romans, where the apostle Paul, he's writing to cr Christians living in Rome. And this is what he says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that sounds great. It, it is great that there's a God that's working things together for your good. I mean, you wouldn't want to follow a God that wasn't on your side, would you? And so while a verse like this, it seems to be encouraging. It seems to be great. It also brings up a number of questions when we think about it. Like, well, who's been called according to his purpose? purpose? I mean, are some people in and some people out? If you have bad going on, is it because that must be his will or that you're not experiencing his will or he's causing that to happen in your life in some way? Maybe you don't love him enough and that's why the bad is going on, right? Or, or even worse, are you experiencing this bad because he wants you to go through it? Like he, he's forcing you to go through it because he's got to teach you something for a purpose or for his purpose? In fact, there's certain lanes of Christianity that will take verses like this and they assume then that God is making all these things happen, that God is somehow like up above, like puppeteering it, like a master puppeteer, and he's creating all the chaos and all the problems and all the heartache in the world. He's puppeteering it to happen because he wants, he has a purpose in all of that, especially if you just keep on reading in the same same chapter there, it keeps going. We read, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But it continues, says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Let's stop there for a second, because those are two big words, foreknew and predestined. These can get really tricky, really quick. Does that suggest then that, that God had certain people in mind ahead of time, that he had certain people in mind that he foreknew and he, he predestined certain people that these are the people that are going to love him, that these are the people that he's going to work out all things for the good for, because he foreknew them, he predestined them. In fact, if you jump over into Ephesians, another book also written by Paul, Paul is speaking to a similar issue and he comments on it like this. For he chose us and him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us. There's that word. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. When some people hear this biblical teaching that God chose us to be in Christ from the foundation of the world or that he predestined us to be adopted into his sonship through Christ, they think that it means that God picked who would be in Christ and then also he must have picked who would not be in Christ. And from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world, they think that Paul is saying that God chose us as individuals and also he must have not chose certain individuals to be in Christ. This, of course, implies then that some are born, like you are born predestined for heaven, which is good. But it also implies that some are born predestined for hell, which is not good. And all of that is to be under the umbrella of God's Will. And so not only is this like a nightmarish thought, but it also stands in counter to the, to the summary and the emphasis of Scripture that God in his nature, he is love and that he is for everybody and he wants everybody to be in and everybody to be saved. And so thankfully, this is not at all what Paul is, is meaning here with the language that he uses about being called according to his purpose or about being chosen before the foundation of the world. See, it's important to remember that when the, in the ancient world, when, 
when the Jewish people would have thought about God choosing people, they would have seen this through the lens of God choosing a nation, Israel, that God chose as his, as his chosen people. Yet individuals could then choose. They had a choice on whether or not they wanted to participate in this corporate election, right? People could walk away from Israel. People didn't have to accept their citizenship. They could leave the land, right? So when Paul says that God chose us, in Christ, he doesn't mean that God chooses us as individuals to be in Christ as opposed to other individuals that he also obviously chooses not to be in Christ, which means that God chose all of us to be in Christ uh, from the very beginning, that God chose all of us. What God decided ahead of time, what he predestined ahead of time was not whether you, me, whether any one of us would be in Christ. What he decided ahead of time is what would happen to those of us that would choose to follow him, that would choose to live out a life in Christ. God determined that whoever chooses to be in Christ would be adopted into his family as children, and they would be holy, and they would be blameless in his sight. And now that we are in Christ, you and me as followers of Jesus, now that we are in Christ, what was predestined for this group of people before the foundation of the world, it now applies to us. Think of it like this. I recently finished coaching a season of volleyball. And, and, and imagine if one day I, and I get all my team together and during practice, I have them sit down. And instead of playing the game of volleyball, I have them watch a documentary, a really boring, long documentary of how to stitch together a volleyball. And after the documentary, one of the players comes up to me and says, Coach, when did you decide that we were going to have to watch such a long, boring documentary? I said, that's a good question. I actually decided three months ago before the season even started. I was putting together my practice plan, and I was trying to decide what to do. And I figured four or five weeks into the season, instead of actually playing on the court, that we would go and look at how the balls were put together in the first place, right? Aren't you glad you got to watch that? Right? And that player could then turn to the team and announce to the whole team, Coach Mitchell decided three months ago that we were going to have to watch this long, boring documentary, right? But notice, I didn't decide three months ago which players would or would not have to watch the documentary. What I predestine is that whoever ends up choosing to be on the team or signing up for the team or making the team, that as a team, we would watch this documentary. My decision was about the team, not the future individual players that would or would not make up the team. It was, a, it, it was up to then each player to decide if what had been predestined for the team was going to then apply to them as well. And whenever Paul talks about predestination in Christ, this is what he means. He means that from the start, God's heart, God, we see this over and over in Scripture, God's heart was always set on humanity be, being incorporated into Christ. God committed himself to making sure, to, he, he predestined from the very beginning that all who would be in Christ would be called and made holy and blameless and justified and, and then ultimately and eventually conformed into the image of Christ. But God didn't predestine which individuals would and would not be in Christ in this, in, into this team of people. God wants everybody to be in Christ. I mean, when you just look at the life and teachings of Jesus, Jesus, what he did, his, his giving up of his life, dying, was for everybody that all could have relationship with God. But here's the thing, is that since God is not a coercive God, he's not going to twist your arm or my arm into forcing us into relationship with him. Love has to be chosen, right? It can't be forced or it's not real love. And so that means that you and I, people, we have the ability to resist God's will and to resist the, the pulling of the Holy Spirit if we so choose. And so what does this all mean? And what does this have to do with God's will? Well, here's the thing, is that when we think of God's will, we're often asking the questions of, God, what should I do? Or God, God, why is this happening? Right? But here's the thing, when you choose to follow Jesus, you're choosing to be part of his family. And I love some of the language that Paul uses in helping us understand God's will. I love that he says in, in Ephesians, he says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And in Romans where he says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined, but it didn't stop there. It says, this is what we've been predestined for, to be conformed to the image of his son. 
Sometimes we can get stuck on God's will being about who's in and who's out. Sometimes we can get stuck about God's will just simply being about all of our individual circumstances. And like, why is this happening? And is this, is this on purpose? God, are you doing this to me? Right? But here's the summary of what Paul teaches, is that God is building a family and he has invited you to be part of it. God is building a family and he wants us to be in it. And God, before the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world, he designed his family to look a certain way. And that family is to look like him. That's why scripture calls us image bearers of God. My, my 11-year-old son, he's tall, he's slim, he acts like me, he's uncoordinated, he's kind of goofy. Uh, that makes sense. He looks like me. He's my son, right? We share some DNA. Have you ever noticed how sometimes couples, the longer that they're together, the more that they start to look like each other, right? Or even like how, uh, how an owner can start to look like its pet, okay? I don't understand how those last two work, but it makes sense that we would look like the people that are in our family, right? And as followers of Jesus, as sons and as daughters, it makes sense that we would share in a resemblance of Jesus. And again, Paul says that this is what you've been predestined for. It reminds me of one of these childhood toys. Did you have one of these? The things with like the, all the nails on one side that you can take and kind of, you know, you put an object like your hand on one side and you let the nails fall and then you can see an imprint of the object that's behind it, right? I remember playing this with a, as a kid and we'd put all sorts of things behind it because it's just kind of fun to see the way that the nails would fall. Maybe you put your face on it or you, you know, wanted to let someone know they were number one. So you put up your favorite finger. I don't know how you used it, but we used it in lots of silly ways. And, and I just happen to think, what if what we can learn from this toy, what if following Jesus looked a lot like this? What if when you say you're part of God's family, when you've been adopted as sons and as daughters, that you start to actually resemble the Father. You start to actually resemble Jesus. And so if it was possible to take like your words and your thoughts and your actions, your deeds, and take them and, and kind of press them up against the back of this and let the nails fall as they will, I wonder would the imprint that you leave, would that look like to the people around you? Would they be like, wow, they, they look like Jesus. They remind me of Jesus. Jesus, they sound like, they make me feel like, would the life that you're living and the words that you speak and the attitudes that you carry, would they look like Jesus to the people around you? Is that the imprint that you would leave? Because the reality is, it's like 2024, it's almost here. And what if this year could be your year that you really let God like reshape and transform your life? What if this is the year that you let God shape your thoughts and shape your words and shape your actions? What if you even let God like shape your dreams that you have for your life? And so when, when, when the circumstances come, when things don't go your way and you're pressed up against it all and the nails fall as they will, at the end of it all, because you can only control yourself, would what you have control over look, sound, feel, like Jesus. That at the end of 2024, you're like, wow, this year I looked a lot more like Jesus than I did last year. What if you get to the end of January or February or March and be like, man, like this month I look more like Jesus than I did last month. This week, this, th today, I look more like Jesus than I did yesterday. And the reality is, is that if you're willing to do that, not only will it make your life better, not only will it help you navigate the complexities of life when things don't go your way, but man, the people around you will benefit. Your family, your kids, your spouse will benefit when you start living and loving like Jesus. Your neighbors, your coworkers, your boss, your employees, who, the people that are closest around you will directly benefit when the impact and the imprint that you leave behind looks, feels, sounds like Jesus. 2024 is fast approaching. Let's commit together to being people that we, where we'd say, you know, we actually believe what Paul says about our predestination, that we, are, we have been chosen before the foundation of the world to become more and more like our creator and our savior. Let's do that together as we head into this new year. Thanks so much for joining us today on this last service of 2023. We hope that you have been encouraged and challenged and are looking forward to becoming the best you in 2024. In fact, we are starting a series called The Best You on January 7th, and I hope that you will come and join us on that day.
Yeah, and real quick before you go, this part's important. Make sure you look below and click on the link for our virtual connection card. Hey, there's two great things that happen when you fill out our connection card. The first thing is that we will make a donation in your honor to Living Water. And then the second thing that happens, it just gives you access to tons of information about East Point. Anything you need to know, you can find there. And also make sure you look below that for the link for the gift. This is your last chance, remember, to give to the gift this year. But thank you for participating. Thank you for watching today and we'll see you again on January 7th.